I'm from Jersey City, and uh, I work in Newark, and nobody has ever accused uh, me of not being able to be heard. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's, it's a challenge to start a presentation by being speechless. But I tell you that the presentations that have been made uh, make me speechless. What I am is a field epidemiologist. I control epidemics. And how complex culture and society is, is uh, an overwhelming thought. I'm reminded of uh, a little after I became chair of preventive medicine at the New Jersey Medical School about 12 years ago. I searched for my favorite author who wrote a book in 1955 called Health, Culture, and Community. His name was Benjamin Paul. And there was a chapter in the book which was, why don't Peruvians boil their water? The simple explanation for protecting oneself from waterborne disease was to boil it. That was the science. But why don't people at high altitudes boil their water? And he demonstrated it was so complex, finding wood that you can't find, and on and on and on. So we got Benjamin Paul. At that point, he was, I think, 98. And he came and he gave a terrific Grand Rounds. So what you're going to hear from me are, is, a, is a discussion of the control of an epidemic, but I want to understand that it's really in the context of health, culture, and community that epidemics, epidemics um, are controlled. Now, what I'm just doing, how to do this, let's see, that goes, there we go. So these are uh, you know, disclosures that in medical school we generally make at the start of talks. Um, one is that I have no financial interest in anything that I'm talking about, and I'm not paid by anybody who can get any profit from what it is that we're doing, although I have no idea who that would be. Um, the other is, um, at the bottom, I, at the bottom, I've listed my field experience in epidemiology, ranging from viruses to bacterial disease, Legionnaire's disease, and occupational, and those I'm a, uh, I'm a learner in the area of hemorrhagic fever. I've never been in a hemorrhagic fever outbreak. So I'm going to talk to you about general epidemiology, not my experience in, in hemorrhagic fever. Uh, that being said, I'm working with the uh, health departments in Newark and other communities and with the Liberian community in Newark, et cetera, on how to deal with the current situation that we're in. And I understand that you're here. Um, to, uh, because you have a deeper interest in the, rather the headlines and what this is all about and that you're interested in my opinions and all these assumptions actually may be wrong, but it's not going to stop. <laughs> so uh, the next slide I would like to go to is not that one. Let's see, what did that just do? Bottom one, not the top one. All right, so um, the two kinds of epidemics. This is basic epidemiology. There's a common source type of epidemic, and there's a there's a person to person kind of epidemic, right? So what's an example of a common source epidemic? Well, let's say that we all had lunch, and let's say for some reason there was cadmium had gotten into the soda fountain. About the heavy cadmium is a heavy metal. About ten minutes later, we would all be having. Uh, spells of vomiting, nausea, erosive gastritis, because cadmium is not a good thing to drink and get in your stomach. And when the last of us, the most hardy of us, if you will, stop vomiting, whatever, the epidemic would be over. And we wouldn't be able to transmit it to anybody else because it's a common source. Right? Then we have person-to-person -person outbreaks, right? Where somebody gets something for whatever reason, their case zero, if you will. And then after a period of time, they transmit it to a couple of other people, and then they transmit it to a couple of other people, and the epidemic sort of pops along until so many people are transmitting it to so many other people that the curve actually starts getting smooth and goes up as long as transmission is occurring. And then at some point, will come down, right? And we have to ask the question of why will it come down? Does it come down because one has a treatment? 
does it come down because everybody who's going to get it has got it and everybody else is immune? Does it come down because the weather changes like it does every year with influenza and we get into a cold season, we get influenza and then it gets warmer and then the influenza goes to the, the southern hemisphere. This is a person to person outbreak. Now, there was an epidemic that I investigated very early in my career, which was contaminated roast beef that was imported from Australia into the United States. And if you're from New Jersey, you like your roast beef rare. So the roast beef was cooked to a moderate temperature, then allowed to cool, then frozen, and then sold to delicatessens. And then we would go in and get a roast beef hoagie, where we would have sliced red roast beef, and we would eat it, and the problem was the beef had been contaminated with salmonella all the way back in Australia. It had been warmed up, so it incubated. It had then been frozen, it didn't kill it. It then had been cut, and we ate it, right? That was a common source. It was an ongoing common source because there was a lot of importation of roast beef, but it was a common source. The problem was that salmonella then can be transmitted, transmitted fecal oral, that is from my feces somehow to somebody else's oral through contaminated food preparation or whatever, and the common source epidemic becomes person to person. So we're dealing with two different kinds of epidemics. Now, this is um, a small epidemic that happened in Nigeria of Ebola. And I think it's going to be uh, instructive to look at it in, in uh, detail. Uh, this is the index case who arrived I believe, from West Africa to Nigeria. I think he was either from Sierra Leone Liberian. or Liberian. Yeah. He was the index case, and he went, to, he went through the airport, he went to a hospital, and people were exposed to this sick person who had lots of virus in him, if you will. And there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen cases that were linked to this patient. So let's, here are all the 13, right, from the first patient. So I would like to introduce you to the, question, the issue of reproductive factor, or the R0, which you'll hear a lot about if you read, and it's never really terribly well explained. But the R0 basically says when you have a case, what is the number of people that that case infects and they get sick, and that's the R0. So the R0 in the first phase here was 13. Okay. Now let's go from R0 for the first case to this case. One to one, the R0 is one. For this, one to one, one to one, and all of these other folks, the R0 is zero. Right? So the average R0 is maybe 0.2. Right? At point two, an epidemic won't be sustained. You have to have an R1 of just a case to replace itself with another case. This person uh, has an R of three, right? Okay. All of the people at the outer rim here, this person, this person, this person, this person, this person, et cetera, et cetera, have an R naught of zero. That was the end of this outbreak. Right? And what I'd like to talk a little bit about in the rest of my time is the implication of the R0 for the epidemic and those things that amplify and attenuate. And, and I'm going to go over it briefly because I think you've heard a lot about, a, a lot about them already. This uh, is a picture from 1979 World Health Organization, and it celebrates the eradication of smallpox. Right? Uh, smallpox was eradicated because of a new approach that was developed by Bill Fagy, Bill Fagy from CDC and some others, which was instead of trying to improve the immunization of the world to 100%, which had proved difficult, for generations. It was basically to find individuals 
who had disease, locate the contacts of those individuals, immunize them, and lo locate the contacts of the contacts and immunize them. And it took a very short period of time, given the long history of smallpox, for smallpox to be eradicated. Right? So this is a, essentially a new surveillance containment approach. I hesitate to go backwards in the slide, the upper button. Yeah. OK, all right. If you look at what the Nigerians did, how they were so hugely successful in controlling this epidemic, what they did was to find all of the individuals who had direct exposure, which was 72, all of the contacts, which was 894, right? And watch those individuals so if they became symptomatic, they could be quarantined, they could be isolated, right? And but what they did in addition is they went out and interviewed and talked with every household within a certain distance of every contact. That was 26,000 households, right? And there it was an issue of education of the individuals in those households so that if perchance they were to get ill, that they would um, find the right uh, approach towards getting medical care and, and becoming isolated themselves. So this is the good news that in a highly urban area like Lagos, Nigeria, when there's an importation of, of Ebola, that a very organized uh, approach can actually contain the epidemic and reduce the R to zero, and that was that was what their goal was. So this is the reality of uh, Ebola in West Africa as of uh, October 18th. Uh, and you see that the numbers are going up for each of the three countries involved. So the question is, what is the R for the epidemic to that point? And this is where some people will tell you, this is really complex, it's multivariate, it's a complex formula, et cetera, et cetera, and essentially exclude you intellectually from being able to understand where, where the number comes from. And I honestly don't think that's necessary, so I want to show you the next slide. Let's just review for a second. If the R is two, then one case leads to two cases, leads to four cases, leads to eight cases, and leads to 16 cases, right? And the total of cases, because remember, somebody's only infectious for one period. They're not infectious for the entire period. So the total of cases grows till at the end of five periods, there are 31 individuals who have, that's your total case count. In the last interval though, there are only 16 new people who are infectious. All the others are, have either succumbed or they've survived and they're no longer infectious. So this is how an epidemic of Ebola grows. It is not two infects four, four each infect four going to 16, 16 each infects 16, which is 132, and 132 each infects 132, which is 17,000, right? I, I've seen this in the newspaper originally. This is nuts. That's not how, I mean, why would biology work that way? You know, the later you are in the case, the more capable you are of infecting more people. It's not how biology works. So this is not how it works. And it doesn't work this way um, either. One goes to two, goes to four, goes to eight, 16, 32, because that assumes everybody stays infectious once they want to become infected. So it's really this, which is not great news at two, but it's not horrific news at two. So if one simply gets out your Excel sheet, if you will, and you figure out that uh, the first case, if you track all the way back, it's reported it been, been in December of 2013, and you figure that there are 13, 15 three-week intervals for reproduction of Ebola, 
then what would the R have to be to get to the number of cases that was uh, reported as of September 26th of this year? And the, uh, and the number of cases was 4,000 at that point, 4,100 or so. The R would have to be 1.7, right? So taking everything into consideration, the R would be 1.7. Now, when I say everything into consideration, we have to remember that this outbreak of Ebola is fairly unique because it's not just in villages, it's in urban, right? So the, the transmission and the culture and a lot of things may be different from village life to urban life and the difference in transmission may be different, so what different as well. So the R we've now calculated is 1.7. Okay, so if it's 1.7 uh, through September 16th, uh, I'm sorry, September 26th, I then calculated if you start at September 26th with 4,000 or so and you go to uh, November 7th where there were 13,241 cases, and I just point out to students, the professors do things at the last minute as well, right? So I did this the day before, about last weekend. Um, the R is 1.74, right? So the issue is that with everything that's gone on with Ebola over this entire time, it hasn't dramatically changed. I would have loved to have seen that the R from late September to November went to 1.2 or 1.1 meaning that the, the epidemic was starting to get to the point where there was a case for every case, but not 1.7 cases. The epidemic is still growing. Now, I thought you would all think that I was an alarmist if I, you all use Excel, if you know you just take the little cursor and you pull down for another few incubation periods. So I went to April 3rd of 2015 and I said, okay, at 1.74, how many cases would we have? And the answer was uh, 280,000 total cases, right? By next April, there would be 280,000 cases. And for those people who've worked in this epidemic or in any epidemic thinking about what life in society is like when there are 14,000 cases total, what would it be like when we're at that level? It is a breathtaking uh, re um, revelation. So the question is, was I being alarmist? So I went to the much more sophisticated, oh, did it again. Oh, is the middle one again? Uh, the top one. Top one. Okay. So I went to the CDC, much more sophisticated analysis of uh, the epidemic and predictions. And what it says is extrapolating trends to January 20th, 2015, underlined without additional interventions or changes in community behavior, notable reductions in unsafe burial practices. The model also estimates that Liberia and Sierra Leone will have approximately 550,000 Ebola cases, 1.4 million when corrected for underreporting. So what I thought was alarmist is an underestimate, if you will, if things don't change as far as the circumstances for Ebola transmission in this region. And I think we just have to be realistic that when this is an estimate for three countries, it's not an estimate considering the fact that there might be other countries involved. Now, it was easy to think of the uh, noun for when you turn up your radio, which is amplification. Um, and I struggled to try to think of what is the word when you 
lower the sound on your radio. And I'm not sure, sure there is a sound. Turn down the volume. So I tried to come up with one, and I'm calling it attenuation. And I, I don't know whether there's a more technical term for it. So what amplifies Ebola? You know, I was really tempted in when we were thinking about the um, what's going on in communities to think about the culture of the Latipso, right? I, I don't mean to be facetious, but I went to school when you were pre-med. It was a revelation when your professor talked about the Nasarima. Yeah, do you know the culture of the Nasarima? Well, it's the Americans spelled backwards, right? So the Latipso is the hospital. And you have to think about, with Ebola, you have to think about several cultural things. And one cultural thing is the hospital, where imagine that the circumstances is the sicker the patient is, especially if they're not recovering, the more viremic there is, to the point where at end stage they can have a million viruses per milliliter, which is about the size of a pencil head. And lots of things uh, um, cause those viruses to become, uh, to, to gain uh, entrance to healthcare workers and so forth. So depending on the culture of the hospital, uh, in, in urban, here, there, or everywhere, the hospital and healthcare workers can be a big part of the epidemic. And I think the estimates now are that a, a fairly large percent of the number of the victims of this epidemic are in fact healthcare workers. That culture, the culture of the hospital can change and it can change with the use of, of uh, protective equipment and so forth. So that's one cultural issue. The other is, what do we know about urban transmission and culture in Africa as far as burial practices and other practices? Uh, and I think what you'll see later in one of the later slides is that the epicenter for these epidemics are really now urban more than they are village-based. Now, the good news is that, uh, as we saw in Nigeria, that it is possible to isolate cases and monitor contacts of cases. Monitor is the modern way of thinking about things rather than quarantine. One can monitor somebody uh, since this disease is not infectious before it's symptomatic, one can monitor. And then if somebody becomes symptomatic, the issue is to isolate in a hospital or in some circumstance where there won't be further transmission. And if monitoring fails to be inappropriate for certain people, then quarantine is certainly a possibility. With these three approaches, there can be substantial reduction of transmission to the point where R can get to uh, uh, zero, which is our goal. So that's the good news. The other good news is that we have protective equipment that is effective, and thank goodness somebody invented bleach a hundred or so years ago, which is highly effective in killing virus. So that's the good news, that it is possible to control the environmental aspects of this disease to bring the R zero uh, to zero, or not to zero. Um, and I was really uh, uh, informed to understand where the use of this construction uh, fencing came from and how better it was as far as interaction between people than those canvas uh, sheets which for isolation. Now, this slide uh, will demonstrate that um, uh, the epicenter of the epidemics are really in the urban major centers of the countries, if you will. So it makes this epidemic even more complex than others that have come before that have been really more rural and even village level uh, epidemics. Now we're talking about urban transmission. and. Uh, uh, it would be really wonderful to have as much understanding about uh, urban life in, in Africa.
this is not good news. Uh, the cross-hatched uh, are the uh, locations that are, had their first cases. This is as of about um, through October 18th. The crosshatch is where their new cases are occurring. And you know, this is now occurring in the periphery of Liberia. And this is in the northern area of Sierra Leone. And the question is, is the outbreak spreading outward? And so there, it's not just an issue of the R and what it is, but whether there, this outbreak can go outward, essentially consuming more communities and states, et cetera, as it goes forward. The R might uh, stay the same, but the number gets so much larger that it actually causes a greater growth in the epidemic than I showed you before. So here's some good news. This is from Molly. This is the story of a family that on October 3rd lost their father, who was a healthcare worker. And uh, the second wife of the grandfather, who was called a grandmother, I guess, came and uh, 800 miles by by a bus uh, from Mali down to Liberia to take care of the granddaughters. Uh, and she did. She uh, took the granddaughters and a brother, apparently, uh, through local transportation for 800 miles back to Mali. Um, Along the way, there were, um, disregard this slide for a minute, I'm not going to ask how to use this again. Um, along the way, there were about 100 people who were exposed. And those 100 people were all uh, identified, their contacts were identified. Uh, there were no additional cases that occurred from those 100 contacts. Molly was able to control uh, an outbreak, a potential outbreak, just the way Nigeria was, and that one girl who died did not lead to many other cases. Her, her, um, the effect of her infection was an R of zero again. So this is good news. It is possible, even in probably one of the poorest countries in the world, to do this kind of contact tracing and uh, reduce um, exposure. That's the good news. That was, uh, I've made that slide on November 8th or so, and November 12th, there's a report from Mali of a local uh, religious leader who dies of Ebola, unconnected to the young girl. And there's a report of the nurse who took care of her has died, him, has died of Ebola. So now there are two cases in Mali. And these are not new cases. The, if the nurse died now, then the imam probably died weeks before. So now there's potential of having seeded many more strings of infection in Mali, all of which need to have the same sort of intensive follow-up as the uh, episode that I described to you in Nigeria. You're talking about huge efforts towards contact tracing, isolation, and potential quarantine. Huge efforts that are unclear that the resources are there to, to mount. We saw a picture like this for bats, and I sought a, a picture uh, like this to ask, basically, where, where is the urban continuity in sub-Saharan Africa? If there are new cases at the boundaries as we go north, well, they're desert beyond there, and it's unlikely to, to continue person to person in that direction. But the question is, what's going to happen in Cote d'Ivoire and so forth? What is the connection between these countries? What's not, and I don't mean formal at the border crossing, but back roads, country to countries with family living on both sides of the border, things that will escape uh, um, 
our understanding until we start seeing cases in surrounding countries. How will this be stopped? So my conclusions are that epidemic control is a medical and a social science effort that's embedded in biology, embedded in culture, community, economics, and politics. Um, and it's not just going to come, and I think you've heard this today, it's not just going to come from basic epidemiologic theory, but it's epidemiologic theory embedded in what we know about cultures and how that theory can work versus make things worse, as you've described. The major epidemic in West Africa is perilous. It's not at all clear that it's uh, slowing down. Uh, reports of decreased numbers of cases in the urban area uh, may be good news. It may just mean that it's shifting to more rural areas. It may be, mean that people are avoiding the formal and taking care of things on their own and that the epidemic continues, that they're just cases are not caught in the surveillance system. The next conclusion is that with resources, that uh, the R can be expected in some instances to be high. 13 is what we saw in Nigeria. Uh, um, two is what we saw in Texas. But that uh, with added effort, that those can be brought to zero very quickly. So we're not going to see major epidemics in countries that have the capacity to jump on imported cases and control the, the, the mini epidemics within one, two, or three reproduction periods. So I wouldn't expect that there be a worldwide pandemic where it's going to go country to country to country as an, an influenza or something like that could do. But it's very possible that uh, there could be uh, transmission from West Africa to other countries where there aren't the resources to control like Nigeria had and that we could see more trouble uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, I really think that this epidemic, like no other that I've ever seen, is going to be the test of humanism in the United States and worldwide. Whether there will be a reversion to isolationism, whether people are going to come up, people, countries, others, non-countries, NGOs, etc., are going to come up with adequate uh, money and personnel to adequately control uh, this situation. And I'd like to I'd like to emphasize what Bill Fagy taught us all at, at the CDC is that you know, there's only one lifeboat for the world, and we're all in it together. So it's not like we can ignore, think that there's another lifeboat for somebody else. We're in this all together. And the final thing that I'd like to say, which Bill Fagy did not teach me, comes from uh, schools of management and business. It comes from Deming, who was the person who revolutionized uh, industry in Japan after World War II. And it's why Japan had such high quality manufacturing goods. And the idea is that you plan an intervention, and then you do it, and then you check whether it works, and then you revise, right? And that if what you're doing isn't adequate, then you change. You modify what you're doing, and you do it better until it works. And this is con called continuous improvement. So it was a tragedy what happened in Texas. But I think that we all learned something from Texas such that we're not in Texas anymore, that we have learned how to do this in a better way. And it's not so clear to me that what we're doing now is going to be effective or even, in some instances, totally necessary, everything that we do, and that we will improve again. And my hope is that this continuous improvement process is viewed as constructive um, and acknowledged by the population that it may not all go right uh, as we proceed through this epidemic. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.